Are there any other supplements that you recommend women to take based on the way that we live our lives and the food that we eat? Vitamin D. Okay. Um, and why? And what does that do? So if we're looking at vitamin D, especially vitamin D3. What's the difference? So you have vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is more of a storage form. It's not converted to being a functional form. So if you take D3, it's already a functional form. So that means your body's going to take it in and use it as it should be. So we're looking at a vitamin D3 supplement. Then we are able to boost circulating levels of vitamin D3 or vitamin D that's usable. And it's used for every system in the body. And it's really important now, especially I'm coming from the Southern Hemisphere just out of winter. You're in the upper parts of the Northern Hemisphere in the middle of winter, and we don't get enough sun. And when we're looking at now all the worries for skin cancer, people are slip, slap, slop, you know, sunscreen, hat, clothes, and we don't get enough. And then if we're looking at our food supply, there's not a lot of proper vitamin D rich foods. You're looking at mushrooms or fortified dairy products. And those tend not to be consumed a lot nowadays. So if we're improving the amount of vitamin D3 that we're taking in and the amount of vitamin D that's circulating, we have better recovery, we have better muscle function, we have better brain health, we have pretty much every system is affected in a positive way. Omega-3? Yeah, omega-3s are good, especially as we get into peri and postmenopause. We want to look at uh, how inflammation affects the cells. So if we look at using a really good vitamin D or sorry, a really good omega-3 um, and omega, uh, I guess we're looking at the types of omega-3s that are in there. Then we're enhancing cellular integrity that our estrogen used to help with anti-inflammatory properties. It's not something that everyone needs to take. It's something that we have to consider when we start getting into our late 30s, early 40s, maybe get a blood test for it, see how your omega-3 levels are and then consider dosing with a really good fish oil. What about iron levels? Because I've had a friend of mine who is a woman um, tell me that their iron levels were low. This is common. And we see that there's the incidence of a change in the norms when we're looking at the reference ranges. And I find it really interesting that the reference ranges that we have for all of our blood markers are shifting to a sicker population. What does that mean? So if we're looking at the bell curve and we're taking population data, overall our society has become sicker. So now we're seeing that the norms for iron used to be a ferritin of 50 or lower was considered low ferritin. Now it's 26 for women. We look at testosterone, lower testosterone now for men is normal. And it is because that is just what a sedentary population now presents. But if someone is active and comes to me and says, you know, I had my iron tested and it's sitting at 26, and they say that it's normal, but I feel awful. It's like, that is not normal. If you were part of my high performance athletic crew, we want to see minimum 50, preferably 100. So we have to supplement you to bring it up. And it's a really specific area of how we supplement. It's supplementing every other day with a very high bioavailable iron. And when we start looking at how we are supplementing every other day with either a carbonyl or a glyconate, then we're really able to boost that ferritin and people start to feel better. What does iron do and how does someone who's iron deficient feel? So iron is responsible for that those heme groups that I was talking about with oxygen carrying capacity. Hemoglobin, early, the blood thing, yep. the blood cells. Yeah, their blood cells. So iron is responsible for allowing those heme groups to carry oxygen. If we have low iron, then we don't have enough oxygen circulating throughout the body or being used by the body. So you feel very flat, very tired. You start to get really dark circles under your eyes. Um, it's a mission to do anything. So it's like a deadened fatigue. And people are like, this, this isn't stress-oriented fatigue or jet lag-oriented fatigue. This is fatigue where I can't even walk up the stairs without getting winded. What foods have iron in them or iron-rich? So primarily red meat is where a lot of people turn to. But if you are more plant-based, then we look at leafy greens. We look at nuts and seeds, but using a lot of vitamin C with that. Preferably adding um, a little bit of olive oil on our salads. 
uh, maybe cooking in an iron skillet to improve the amount of iron that comes into the food. And we also know that we have to time it with what we call hepcidin or hepcidin, depending on where you come from in the world. It's an enzyme that decreases the body's availability of iron absorption. It increases with inflammation. So it's higher after training for about five hours in men and in reproductive women. And it can be elevated for up to 24 hours in late peri and early postmenopausal women. So basically, how do I supplement? Supplement before training or at night away from training. 